I'm Renard Smith. I'm running for Compton City Council, District Number Three. I'm Renard Smith. I was born and raised in Compton, California, and still live here in Compton. I'm a third generation resident. Uh, my family moved here. My grandmother moved here from Texas. Uh, she hitchhiked here to Compton uh, in 1957, and uh, she is now 101. And uh, my father and mother both met at Walton Middle School and went to Compton High School and married later on. Uh, my father retired from the city of Compton uh, in the career link. His name is Henry Smith, pretty well known around the, the city and the community because that's a forward fa front facing area. I started in Compton as an anti-violence advocate. I began advocating many years ago under the Parrot administration um, against violence that was actually occurring in the community. I worked with Juanita McDonald, uh, Marcin Shaw, and many of the elected officials that were elected, Yvonne Arsenal, who was elected at the time as well. Um, and we did a few town hall meetings and really did a lot of meetings with each other to try to advocate and, and strategize on how to address violence in Compton. Waking up today, there's so many issues in Compton that I've decided to take my hand to run for public office. There's a lot of work that we need to do and we can do that work together. So my platform is unity, peace and progress. And the reason that is, is because we are not able to actually get anything done until we can unify at the dais. We have to unify at the dais, which I believe will encourage us to actually work harder and be more politically committed to uh, helping the community unify the, the, the different cultures in Compton, the Blacks and uh, the Latino community that are, you know, sometimes at odds or it's, it's a, to me, I believe it's propagated that they're at odds. Uh, and then the gangs that are at odds in Compton. We have to really narrow down on unity. And then once we get to that point, we can really discuss peace and how we reconciliate, how we understand what peace means in our, in our community. And then progress means now we start to look at, look at the economic vehicles. What are the vehicles that we need, like community development, financial institutions, and different angles that we need to look at in order to really economically advance our community. There are so many ideas as it relates to uh, workforce development, economic development, as it relates to housing development and using these very impact investment ways to get those things done. So as a district representative, not only will I be a representative whose office is open at any time for constituents, I will also be forward thinking in the way to really uh, rubber stamp uh, some of the things that we can do to actually change the poverty issues in Compton. So our elected officials currently are part-time uh, are part-time uh, council people. That means that they particularly work, uh, you know, a couple hours a week to attend the, the council meetings. They're not obligated to do, uh, they're not, you know, paper-wise obligated to do anything outside of that based on the charter. Uh, what that does is that actually opens up a great opportunity. Many of the council people have not used the opportunity to be an extra advocate for Compton, being able to travel on behalf of Compton to help to encourage uh, policy. We are paying lobbyists outrageous amounts of money, and that's the job of the council person. Uh, that council person should be in these different state offices uh, advocating on what's going on in Compton. And when they hear constituent issues that go beyond their measure as, as a local municipal, they should be advocating. So the, what, what would make me significantly different is I would use all of that extra time. I'm a businessman, and that's where most of the previous council people have been as well. They've had their regular career jobs and have done this on the side, if you will, this is not a job for the side. It is time for an, uh, a representative that is going to advocate for their district, advocate for the city, and pool resources together, as well as build the coalitions on the dais and outside of the dais that actually invite and encourage these type of uh, 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 advancements to our city. So, you know, and thank you for that question, because this is a very stupid time to be running for public office, right? Uh, when I started this thing in September, I, or excuse me, when I started exploring uh, in, 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 in August, per se, of last year, um, and I've got on the phone with so many, like, Democratic folks that are strategists and everybody's like, hey, I can't talk to you. The presidentials are coming up. Call me in November. And so, I, you know, I kind of kept keeping people warm, but most people were very generous with their time, generous with their advice and so forth. And so then we got to September. And so I'm like, okay, okay. So we're and at this point, I'm like more solid in my decision. And then we get to November, the election happens. We do amazing. 
Um, and so then I reach back out to all those people. And they're like, ah, yeah, I want to help you, but uh, actually I can't. Uh, I'm focused on Georgia right now. So it's, it's been a really tough time to actually run for office. And then with all that said, um, I'm a very, very uh, progressive candidate, meaning that I'm not taking big money, big interest. Um, I've, if you look at some of my opponents, they certainly are taking bigger money than I am. Uh, the people that have donated to our campaign have been people that have never even donated to a campaign. So it's definitely an uphill battle. Um, but that uphill battle I'm really proud of because what it does is it excludes me taking all these different interests uh, in, in this particular race. But it's very difficult because people are tight. Even big business is tight with donating money because we don't know where the economy is going to go. There's this COVID. It's just a lot going on. So it's a very interesting time to run, but I'm very, I'm thrilled to do it. I, I believe in God and believing in the organizing of, of, of volunteers and, and the community together um, to get, to get to the point. Public safety is, is, is something that, that we always talk about, right? And, and, and we, we, we talk about it in a way that to me is, is archaic because we know the social issues that exist in our community. We know that there's gangs, there's guns, there's violence in our community. Um, but yet when we say public safety, we think what are the solutions to those things? Law enforcement. When we talk about law enforcement, um, we, we almost have a, 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 a divorced conversation about what's being done right, what's being done wrong, or what's not being done at all. Um, we have to reshape our accountability. The accountability is not specifically on government alone to enforce the laws. It starts certainly at home. And it starts with the accountability of what parents have to pursue with teaching their children what's right and what's wrong as they're in the community. What they may be able to do at home, they aren't able to do in the public. Um, and that's just an accountability thing. So that's like knowing that if your son is going outside to hang out with friends and they're carrying guns or what have you, you have to be accountable as a parent to say, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? Um, and so when we talk about public safety from the law enforcement side, well, law enforcement and police, we probably, and this is going to be radical, I'm not a defund the police guy. I mean, I, I, I'm probably going to get torn down for that. Uh, socially, because I'm not a defund the police guy. I think that was a knee jerk reaction. What I am is an, uh, is an accountability um, guy. I am certainly about um, how we need to be radical about reform and certainly believe in reform, meaning let's stop calling them police officers. If they want to do their job, let's call them peacekeepers and, and look at a model like the UN looks at. Instead of them saturating communities after a violent uh, attack has or after a violent uh, uh, shooting has happened, why aren't peacekeepers on the ground? And then they are there if, if in fact the area is still unstable. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that we can look at public safety, um, even going so far as to have relationships and conversations that I'm initiating uh, with, with different technology companies that are doing public safety advancements, putting different apps on people's doors that may help law enforcement in the time of uh, crime. Uh, just by being able to see that go across the screen of, a, of all of these different camps that might be at people's doors. So there's a lot of different ways that we can be modern and forward thinking. Um, so water in our state is, is a big, big issue. Water has become a commodity that, that none of us really understand uh, financially, neither do we understand uh, resourcefully. And so, you know, we really have to look at very forward thinking ways. I mean, this brown water that comes out of people's faucet, all, out of all of the voters that I've spoken to, and obviously I, I'm someone that has turned on my faucet a number of times and I've had brown water come out or sp sp sputting, sputting water come out. Um, I, I, you know, if, if, if I were to be honest and, and probably I'm, I'm a little too, uh, 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 forward thinking to, to probably say this, but what I, what I truly believe is that what we have is an infrastructural issue. And I think that uh, the city officials would agree. Um, and, and this is what's happening in every municipality. It's not just Compton. So I, I hate when, you know, we're looking down at ourselves and going, oh my God, Compton has all these infrastructure problems. It's every municipality across the world. But the piping that is at the street level that's owned and maintained by, this, by cities very few cities have the money to actually go in and do those things. So what they do is they play this game of whose responsibility is it? Same thing with potholes. Who, who, whose responsibility is it? You know, and the truth is it's, it's a partnership. And certainly 
you know, residents who may have older plumbing or older, at, at our residence per se, let, let me give an example at, at our house. At our house about 10 years ago, we had to drill from the front door to the street because of a bad pipe that had just it kept backing things up and just all kinds of disastrous things that we dealt with for years and years and years until we said no. It cost us probably 10 grand to do it. Uh, and then come to find out it didn't solve the problem. So what it told us is that it, it the street piping. Um, so it, once, once we get our world in a place where we can really look at economic development and cities like Compton can see revenues generate and we have the money to go in and do these type of huge infrastructure projects with, with cities like Torrance and Carson does as well, uh, then, then we'll, we'll, we'll really continue to push it back on the homeowners, unfortunately. So displacement happens when you have cities just like Compton that do project labor agreements uh, poorly and they work with these retail developers who don't give a dang about whether or not people have a place to live. They, they offer some puny amount of units that are, or, or, or homes that are, you know, affordable if that. And it certainly sometimes more than often pushes people out the community. That, that, that's economics. If the city was doing a better job with making sure that they were inviting business into the community, taking the ingenuity that's already in the community and supporting that, not just with training and programming, but with seating, right? Uh, and then looking at developers that come into the city and don't say, hey, we, we, why do all the developers want to develop houses in Congress? Because they're trying to get the biggest bang out of their buck. They don't want to. They don't want to build multifamily. They want to build houses because they're like, we want the biggest bang for the buck. Get in and get out. Take the cash and go. Because we should have had by now live workspace in Compton. We should have had by now co working space in Compton. There's too much ingenuity. And let me tell you something. South LA and Watts, even Watts. They get impact investment. They get community development financial institutions that are, that are putting incubators and accelerators into those communities. It never makes it to Compton because the leadership in Compton is poor. The business sense in Compton is poor. And we have a, we have a, 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 a bigger job to do with reforming City Hall. Um, and we have a, a, a more specific job to bring leaders that are gonna advocate the way uh, that's forward thinking, that's up to current, that's post COVID. That's the other thing. Anybody that's thinking traditional is out of whack. You have to think post COVID. Every city is going to be going through it. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Just so, Fatima, you have to send, send me this video and I'll, I'll start to. Oh, yeah.